Hi, welcome everyone. Thank you very much. It's great to see MA, the two MAs of the University of Glamorgan, the students representing the two MA courses here today. We have MA Art Practice and MA Arts, Health and Wellbeing. So lovely to see you all. This is a special kind of day, certainly for me. I, I mean, that remains to be seen whether it is for Ron. But um, just to give you some context first before I ask Ron some questions and we look at some of his um, very diverse work, just to give you kind of a little bit of context, is um, this exhibition, which is called Ron Lawrence, A Retrospective, opened at the university in this year, asks what is our centenary year, 2013. But it's not just a celebration of 100 years of this is an educational establishment. In fact, the building we're standing in, um, T. Crawshays, it's now called, was being used from the year 1913 onwards. So the very first students here were studying um, mining and mining engineering and related activities. And you know, we think we live in a global culture now, but in 1913, the first students who were Welsh to a certain extent, but they also included that first, very first cohort, students from China, a hundred years ago. So, you know, there's a long tradition here at the uni. So in 2013, given that what we now call, of course, the University of South Wales, um, it began partly here as the School of Mines a hundred years ago, I thought um, that it was time that I should look at a different type of artist from South Wales. And, you know, in the last 10 years that I've been involved with this activity, I've been looking at senior artists of similar age to Ron. I'm sure he won't mind me telling you that he'll be 84 in August, which is hard to believe. Um, I've looked at a lot of that kind of generation of artists who've been active for the 40, 50, 60 years. From various parts of South Wales, either artists, male or female, born in South Wales or who've come into South Wales and worked. But I've never actually looked at someone who's literally under our noses, and that's Ron. You know, Ron is from here, he's from Pontypree. He was born just up the road, and he lives just up another road, if I can put it that way. So, um, it was important, I thought, in our centenary year, and what is now our merger year, to celebrate very literally homegrown talent, um, as I say, Ron Lawrence. But there's another anniversary this year, because 2013 is 60 years, it marks 60 years of, of Ron being a professional exhibiting artist. So he, he began exhibiting professionally in 1953, where I'm pointing at the moment, that is the very first painting that was exhibited in 1953 to the side of the stairs. It's um, called Zion Street. It's, it's an area of Pontypridd. Um, so again, it actually relates to, the, to this location. So Ron has been exhibiting professionally for 60 years. But as you can see from looking around, he's not just a painter, he's also a sculptor, photographer. He, you know, there's no kind of restriction to the kind of materials that, that he's using. Um, or perhaps there are few restrictions. There's quite quite a wide variety. Another aspect of Ron is that for half that amount of time, 30 years, he's been an art educator. So he's very keen to be here today to talk with me in front of you and then to talk to you individually after this session. Um, so for 30 years, half that 60 years of exhibiting, for 30 years he was teaching primarily at Cardiff Philly, just down the road. Um, amongst other things, was head of what used to be called CDT, Craft Design Technology, but as he'll tell you later on, it, it wasn't restricted to the kind of conventional CDT. Um, he took his students into areas of painting and photography, um, was quite an unconventional teacher, which often perplexed the, the inspectors, um, and is still kind of ready to throw me off balance at times with ideas and, and, and approaches to things. So there's a, there's that refreshing attitude continues. So I thought perhaps Ron, we could start, as I said, with some of these pictures around us. Um, I mentioned Zion Street, 1953. Maybe that's a good place to start. So in the 50s, you were a 
figurative painter, you were painting yeah, yeah. these kind of pictures. Tell us a bit about that painting and, and that first Arts Council exhibition at which it was shown. Well, two years previous to painting that painting, I was walking along Bell Road in Pondicreed, looking across the river at that particular scene. And something clicked and I thought, there, there's a subject there. But nothing happened. I just didn't. So I forgot about it and I went on doing other work. And about two years later, I passed the exact same spot and something clicked. I went straight back home. Oh, I did a quick sketch. I went straight back home and did the painting in about three hours. And then the following year, it was exhibited in the first Welsh Arts Council exhibition, first Welsh Arts Council open exhibition in Cardiff. And you were telling me um, that at that time you were making your own yeah, oil paints. Yeah, all so of that is paint which I, I bought the raw pigment, got the linseed oils and the varnishes and all the rest of it and experimented a lot. Uh, and most of the early pictures that are some around the corner, then in the 50s, were all done with paint that I manufactured myself. Because I thought, well, start at the beginning, let's find out. I used to make all my own stretchers, stretch my own canvases, prime my own canvases, and still do. Um, make my own frames. So I wanted to encompass every aspect of making paintings. And that's where it all started. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this exhibition has been a, a wonderful challenge for me as curator to put together and select with Ron. Um, not only is there such a diverse range of um, ways of working, you, know, you mentioned frames there, you know, there's a great variety of frames. So that presented its own challenge in how I hung the exhibition. But I don't really want to talk too much at this moment about me curating it. Let's just go back to the 50s again. Right. It's easy, perhaps even for me, as recently as 10 years ago, to think, well, you know, so what? So, you know, Ron was painting a street in Pontypridd in 1953, and he was exhibiting in the first Arts Council exhibition. You know, it would be easy for us to perhaps take that attitude, unless we sort of think of context. So what we've got to do for a moment, what I'd like to do with you, is imagine yourself back into the 50s. Essentially, people were using black and white photography. You know, most people weren't using colour. Um, most people didn't see original paintings. When I was asking Ron, you know, he, he hadn't really met a real artist when he was a youngster. Exhibitions, you know, we, we have them all the time now, they weren't really happening. So, you know, this is, that painting, it may not look like it now, but that was quite a kind of radical kind of painting. And in the 50s, there was a debate across the United Kingdom, really, and, and you know, Western Europe, if you like, about what, how should we paint? And certainly in this part of the world, a view was that you paint your locality, which actually was quite a radical thing to do. Um, that's become known now, because we're 50, 60 years on, it's become known as Welsh environmentalism, that way of painting. So, you know, Ron painting that, it, it's, it's actually recording, although he didn't realise it at the time, but, you know, looking back, it's recording a particular debate about what kind of work does an artist do and what kind of subject matter, if any, should, should they adopt. Yeah, so you've got some local views and in the side room, which we'll look at, you also painted um, this the boy and the, 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 the girl yeah, pictures yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. What you'll notice as you're walking around as well is there's a certain kind of colour to your 50s work. Mm -hmm. Sort of... Um, Grey, you know, neutrals and earth colours. Yes, well, I think. Conscious? What, yeah. One of the things I've noticed that painters who tend to paint in this country, not Wales, in England and Wales, tend to be tonal painters. Yeah. And it's simply because of the quality of the light. That's why in France, and it, that's why painters go to the south of France, because of the quality of the light. And if you go there and paint, mm -hmm. you will paint a totally different tonal value. In fact, colour becomes important. And that's why we get the, the Welsh painters like the Forbes and all these people that exploited colour because they saw colour because of the quality of light. Graeme Sutherland, for example, lived in Pembroke for many, many years and produced his best work there simply because he could get down near the estuary where he talks about the quality of the colour of the light, which he experienced when he had a house in the south of France. So there's something to do with where we live is what we paint. Um, 
But there are British colorists, there are, there are colorists, but tend, if you look at most uh, of English and Welsh painting, uh, they tend to be torn out paintings. Ron mentioned there about you know, painting according to the, the landscape or the environment part of Europe that we're in. So that's a nice key for me into this picture here, which is called the bandstand, which is, some of you have recognised it previously, it is Pont de Prix, isn't it? Yeah. So you know, you've got that reference to locality, but you can see now, we've jumped now from the 50s to the 70s, and stylistically, you know, this is me, the curator and art historian speaking, but stylistically, Ron is painting a different kind of realism now. Um, we might call it a naive realism, or even a kind of super realism. Um, so before I say anything else, Ron, if you want to tell us something about this picture, I, I don't know quite what to say about it. Um, I mean, it's, it, who's the subject? So what's that mean? Oh, they're, they're my daughters. The faces it's, are so yeah, they're my striking. They're my daughters, both my daughters. Um, I think what happened, I was exhibiting in the Royal Academy and one of the paintings uh, became what they call a doubtful. You're allowed to put three paintings into the Royal Academy and um, they can be accepted or rejected. But there is a category called doubtful, which is accepted by the main selection committee, but rejected by the hanging committee. There are two committees. Yeah. And that's because if you haven't got the right colour frame or your picture doesn't fit the space, you become a doubtful. Well, one of those doubtful paintings, a gentleman phoned me from London and he said, could I use that painting? Um, and I'm going around all the people that had these doubtful to put on an exhibition in the Royal Exchange, which I did. Uh, and then, a man who ran the Portal Gallery in London saw this painting and said, could you produce some paintings for my gallery in London? Well, I went up to the gallery and immediately it became clear that the type of painting he was expecting was a kind of naive realism. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and so I started to paint. I, I was already going that way, but it seemed to me at the time the thing to do. And so I started painting uh, there's one example next door, Adam and Eve, uh, where each Christmas he would ask the artist to paint on a particular religious theme each Christmas, and we all did Jonah and the Whale and all the rest of it. Um, so that's how that, that sort of thing started. Um, yeah, I mean, the sort of doll-like faces, um, you can see hints of that when you think of some of the earlier work of Lucien Freud, perhaps, but also the Portal Gallery. Some of you may have heard of it, but the Portal perhaps is best known in recent years for being a the gallery that handled the work of Beryl Cook, um, who you know, is considered as kind of kitschy and perhaps not a, a serious artist by some people, but certainly has been one of the best selling artists mm -hmm. in the UK. I mean, she's born 1926, I think, Ron's 1929, you know, so it's hard to believe, isn't mm -hmm. it? But you know, that kind of. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Portal Gallery has been quite an important London gallery and influenced quite a lot of artists. And, that is 70s, and then if we come to this very big picture here, um, in the middle of this wall, this is also, it just sneaks in under that date, it's 1979, pretty sure it's 79, yeah. So this is Adam and Eve. Um, Ron, can you tell us a bit about this, because, yes, it's well, a it painting. Well, follows, it follows on from the Adam and Eve picture I did for the yeah. Porto Gallery, and also there's a drawing next door, black and white drawing, which I did at the same time, roughly. And then I started painting this one. Don't ask me how long it took me, I had no idea. <laughs> Everybody asks that, but I've got no idea. In fact, to be honest, I don't remember painting most of it. Uh, it's as though you get into a trance with these dots, and you're just like a little machine going dit, 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 and uh, time passes. The only thing, the thing I can remember painting are the figures, but the rest of it, I have no idea. <laughs> so, so again, yeah, Ron is using this pantalist technique. But again, certainly one of many things that struck me is, you know, it, it's going beyond pure realism. Um, something else is happening, and it's a kind of a fantasy element happening in it. But in addition to that, there's the sculptural quality, you know, where the, are the animals becoming hedges, or the hedges becoming animals, and then there's the trees. So, do you want to talk about it? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm non-religious, uh, so these paintings are seen from a... a almost a non-religious stories as far as I was concerned. And I thought, 
before everything happened, what was there? Were the animals there before in some form or another? Was everything there waiting for this magic moment? And the magic moment would come when the two hands touched. They were just about to touch. And that would happen and everything would become real. So yeah, that's the narrative side. Um, going back to the kind of sculptural side, you know, this is another yeah, key yeah. for me to yeah. sort of talk to you about your... Well, I was doing sculpture alongside this yes. at the time. Um, what date is it? This, this is, is 79. Yeah. Well, prior to this, I'd been working on welded steel sculptures. You can see photographs of them in the magazine next door. Um, and they were quite large things, sort of six, seven foot steel sculpture things. and. Um, and what I, I'd like to come is the first painting is uh, very geometric because I love geometry. And what I found was I was doing lots of that kind of painting at the time, uh, squares, and, and eventually they became abstractions, just squares and rectangles. And by chance, I happened to go into a scrapyard near where I taught, and two boys that I taught, father, ran the scrapyard. So I had free run of the scrapyard. And when I went in, I found piles of little square pieces of metal which had been stamped and discarded in the factory. And there were piles of them, all shapes. So I gathered up a big pile of these, took them home, bought myself a welding kit, and started welding these sculpture, these geometrical into sculptures. That's how the sculpture. Yeah, I mean, again, one thing that strikes one about the large Adam and Eve painting here is there is a symmetry. Um, Ron was mentioning their geometry. There's a geometry and a symmetry to it, kind of central axis. Um, let's perhaps talk a little bit about, more about the sculptures, and maybe we can talk about these two works, Ron. Um, well, this is this is when I was doing the welded steel. It's a very small one. Um, that's based on a, on a shell I found in a beach down in Swansea, to sort of half a shell, and uh, um, it seemed to me like a head form. So I just made it into a head. And again, it has a kind of symmetry, and I suppose there's a hint of surrealism, isn't there, in, in that picture? Yeah, there's a hint of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think there is, a, there is a fine element of surrealism running through a lot of those. There things. is. Yeah. 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 Before we go on to this piece, if I can just stay with the welded, this is welded sculpture. Ron made this 1978 or thereabouts, mm -hmm. and the big painting 79. But if we go back a moment to the 60s, uh, Ron, you know, this is a difficult thing to say when the artist is next to you, but, you know, if, if I'm the art historian again talking, um, you know, one might say that a kind of critical moment for Ron as an artist was the 1960s. Not, not the 50s painting, perhaps so much, but the 60s, because in the 60s, we could quite genuinely describe Ron as a cutting-edge, avant-garde sculptor in Wales. He was using welded steel, um, in the year 1965, he, had a, he was part of a major group show at the National Museum of Wales. It was a touring exhibition, which had a strange title. It was called the St. David's, St. David's Exhibition. And it's because it began with the tour on St. David's Day, 1st of March, 1965, and they toured Wales. So, you know, so Ron was showing this kind of really radical, and for the 60s, that was quite shocking for, for some of the audience to see abstract, welded steel sculptures in a gallery setting. You know, so although this is a 70s example, Ron was doing that in the 60s, so that was quite an important moment. But as we're already seeing, Ron isn't someone who lets, you know, he's, he's the Rolling Stone, isn't he? Um, 60s Rolling Stone. Um, I don't like the Rolling Stones. He's a music, <laughs> I'm a he's jazz fan. He's a jazz, <laughs> he's a jazz man. But, you know, he doesn't stand still. There's, there's always a constant change. So we, we have the welded sculptures that go back to the 60s, but then we've got this. I should perhaps refer to the date. This is about 1985 now. You, you started, car this is casting now in aluminium. So could uh, what happened, I always wanted to do some lost wax method when I was teaching, but I found that the equipment and all the rest was too expensive for school, so I abandoned that idea. And at the time, polystyrene was becoming a common material. Uh, it's everywhere now, but in those days, it wasn't all that, you know, not much of it about. And we used to use it in school with hot irons for cutting designs in a little sheet and so on. And it struck me that uh, by applying heat to this, you reduce it to almost nothing. 
which is exactly what the lost wax method. Are you acquainted with the lost wax method? No? Well, most of the old type sculpture, the Benin bronzes, for example, in Africa, and they were first of all molded in wax. Then that wax was encased in a kind of a plaster and put into a furnace. And of course, as soon as you heat the wax, it all runs up and leaves the shape inside the mold. So then you could pour your bronze in and cast. And I thought, why the hell can't I do it with polystyrene? So I modelled everything in polystyrene first, put it into a, a box of sand, and just poured the hot metal in. I bought myself a furnace, poured the hot metal in, of course, it melted all the polystyrene and filled up the shape, and that's the shape that comes out. So as you do, you see, you know, it's just, it just happens, it's like, okay, I'm going to do, have, get a furnace and cast. <laughs> so we, well, by now, we've got Ron, who's made his own paints, um, Ron, who's the metal welder and avant-garde sculptor, and now he's working in a new kind of technique. Again, only a few kind of artists in Wales have sort of pioneered this. The only other one I knew was a chap called Frank Roper yeah. in the College of Art in Cardiff. Yeah, and Frank he... Roper became head of art at Cardiff Art School um, in the sort of 60s, 50s, 60s. And I think by the 60s, 70s, he's pioneering the polystyrene method. So again, quite, quite a kind of a radical approach. If you move back from technique to kind of subject matter, obviously this is quite organic. We call this piece Bud Burst. So again, maybe there are kind of connections back to, to nature. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you said to me, Ron, that you love painting green. Mm -hmm. So Most people don't. Most people don't know <laughs> the problems of green. So that then takes us to, surely to this picture, which we need to look at next. Um, I was saying, you know, that some commentators might say the, the kind of Ron's, you know, 60s period was his sort of avant-garde phase. I mean, this is the problem with labels, obviously, as an artist as well as an art historian myself, you know, I, I share Ron's um, scepticism about labels, yeah. but, you know, your, your students, they're useful, you know, so we need to know the labels, but we mustn't be slaves to them, I think that's the point. Um, but, so there was that moment in the 60s when he was cutting edge, if you can put it that way. But um, another way of looking at artists is, you know, we, I could name names. You know, if I said Van Gogh, you'd probably think Sunflowers. If I say Leonardo da Vinci, you'd probably think the Mona Lisa. Now, there are certain pictures that people get associated with, and again, to un unfairly pigeonhole wrong for a second, if he's known for one picture, um, it may be this one, because it's owned by the National Library of Wales. Um, it's been exhibited in group shows and various shows several times. It's arguably the most popular painting owned by the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth, which incidentally, if you haven't been, it has an amazing collection of Welsh art. It isn't just the National Museum in Cardiff. Um, a section of it has been made into a jigsaw. <laughs> So, you know, there you are. Me, me. <laughs> the pinnacle of success, Ron's work has become a jigsaw. Um, yeah, that's the context. <laughs> We're now in the mid 80s, so this painting dates to the same period as the, the sort of polystyrene, um, then converted into aluminium sculpture. So it's the same decade, it's the mid 80s now. Ron, I, I know where it is, you know where it is, but do you want to tell. It's so open my window of my lounge. Across the river, there's a river in between there and a railway. That fence there is the bottom of my garden, then there's a railway, then there's the main road that goes up to the Ronda. And that's your washing on the line? That's my washing on the line, yeah. And uh, that, that's Sardis Road. Um, it's not like that at all now. I can't see it now because all the trees have grown and the tips have gone, and there's another part of the stand has been built on. So it's, it's changed radically. And that building there was the pit, which was called in my young days Dan's Mako because it was always wet and muddy and my mother used to punish me for going there and getting covered in coal dust because I was so infatuated with everything that was going on around the top of the pit. Uh, yeah, that's... Uh, so one reason for painting it was because perhaps you loved greens, but there must have been other reasons. I mean, this is your home patch. Yeah. Why did yeah. you do this picture? Well, I'm looking at it every day in my life, so I thought I'd better paint it. <laughs> um, 
I mean, it's amazing how things become history. This, this painting is 1984, which turned out to be the beginning of the year of the miners' strike of 84-5. And if you look top left, there's the coal tips that Ron referred to. And you know, we're working in this university now, all of us, studying and working, but perhaps we do forget at times why we're actually working here physically. And it, it is because of that dirty black stuff, which was sometimes called muck, but it was, it was the coal. Um, and it's, the, the tips are gone now. Yeah, completely. So yeah. what, what was a kind of the moment has now become a historical um, object in a way. You see the trees have grown up, so you can't see a whole match from your house now. He has to buy a ticket now <laughs> to see a match. And if you, if you look carefully, and you've got all the anecdotal stuff, you've got children and people climbing over the walls, perhaps having got a ticket. So, <laughs> so um, this is kind of going back to kind of the sort of environmental, the location again. So how does that picture relate wrong to the one next to it of your daughter, which is a very 80s picture again? And you put the music references, maybe? Well, I only had to get the camera out and she would pause. My other daughter wouldn't, but she would. And uh, she was standing in front of her door with all these pictures on the back. So I took a photograph and I, I painted it from that and had her standing at certain times to <laughs> get details and so on. But yeah, that, that's just uh, recording my daughter. So did you, did you sort of manipulate the background? No, no, that's, like as, that's as it was. Yeah, it was all pinned to the bedroom door. Oh. Yeah. So I know you, you are musical yourself, you play the guitar. I mean, was your daughter no, just going no, to listen no, to music? No, just a listener, yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So here we have Ron at one particular, again, kind of a phase, but alongside it then we find Ron moving into we look at this. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, a, you're a different kind of sculptor here, Ron. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, this is carving. Again, you know, it's quite disconcerting, but this is mid '80s, so you're now a stone carver. Yeah. Do you want to? I mean, why? Why do you? Is this a sudden decision to use stone or? No, no. Um, I always carry a pen knife in my pocket. Okay. <laughs> always. Can we see it? Okay. This is the latest one. Right. And ever since I was a boy, going for walks with my grandfather, he used to take me up on the mountain, uh, two things he always carried was a collapsible paper cup, so we could have drinks out of the, the springs that we found on the mountain, and the pen knife. And we did inevitably come back with a stick, with carvings on the, on the stick. It carved the peel and peel it off, and it created all sorts of patterns down the stick. So I'd always been interested in that and then eventually led to messing about with bits of wood and carving them. But I never attacked stone until later on. Uh, it was always wood, messing about with wood. I think it was, it was this piece, wasn't it, that was exhibited in the Oysted Wood? Oysted yeah. Wood, yeah. And in the yeah, 1980s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, to give you kind of context, um, 10 years ago, Ron was just a name in an old catalogue for me. Um, but you know, what I've uncovered is that Ron's won prices at the Osteadford as a painter and as a sculptor and as a photographer. In all three categories you've won prizes. Yeah. Which, um, as I said, I think it's quite disconcerting for most people. It's the versatility of your work that, that surprises. Well, I can't, I can't keep doing the same thing over and over again. I know um, if you want to make a name, that's what you do. You keep doing the same thing over and over and over again and people recognise you by your work. And that's never attracted me at all. Um, because I think there's a certain commercial attachment to that. That if I keep doing this, I, can, I, I, I find I can sell this. So I keep doing the same thing. Uh, not everybody does it, obviously. But uh, it's a kind of prostitution, if you like, I think. Um, and I won't go down that road. So after I've done uh, some of the, the, the sea things at the next door there, uh, there's an embroidery and a, uh, some watercolours. After I've done about half a dozen of those, that's enough. I change tack and then I do something completely like I go carve something or work on the guitars or whatever just to keep changing tack all the time. Uh, I think that's quite unusual in an artist of your generation Ron and you're still in their 80s. You, know, oh, yeah. you talk about kind of postmodernism and a younger generation artist who will switch in a perhaps a disconcerting way between materials but, but it's not so common with somebody who's born in the 1920s. Mm, probably. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, we mentioned photography now in passing. Before we go in the other room, I'd just like to look at this picture with you, Rob. All right, this is a, another kind of deviation, if you like. Uh, this one and that one are the, the two very latest paintings I did, did them last year. And what I did, I set up a still life, photographed it, put it into the computer, and messed about with it in Photoshop, and then took a print, and then worked from the print. That's so how that one came about. Because I love painting still life. I have done quite a few in the past, and, but this is totally different. And that one there, I took a photograph of an orchid, which is that shape you can see there. And I, I've been visiting Pembroke a lot. I have friends there, and I go and stay with them. And, the Pembroke landscape sticks in my mind. Um, and whilst I, pu- I put that orchid uh, photograph on my computer again, and then I started manipulating and blah, 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 and it came out as a landscape. Yeah, so in a sense, that's where you, you've done photography separately. And you made oh, it's in the traditional photography, yeah. There's some examples using, next door of that. Using photography as a means to an end. Oh, this yeah, time, yeah. And then using. Well, one of the things Photoshop. when I was teaching. Uh, especially at the A-level stage, I insisted that every child had a, a camera. Oh, right. And every part okay. of the work they did, when I gave them a brief to work on, every part of it had to be recorded photographically. Even from the very first uh, little model, or a bit of yeah. plasticine, that they, whatever it was. So they're recording process. So they're recording a process okay. all the way through. So, and then, looking at it in retrospect, you could see the, the sense in it, yes. or the nonsense in it. Yeah. 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 And this, of course, would be with And of course, the one thing I always told my students, you would get a good idea, forget it. That's the worst thing you can start with, is a good idea, because you're blinkered. What you've got to do is get away from that. And that's why, that's the way I made them do it methodically. Start from nothing. For example, if you say to, to children, right, we're going to design a chair or a stool. Immediately you get an image. You can't avoid it. You know what chairs and stools look like. So what do you do? Well, I say, right, let's see what happened in the past. So we, we didn't have computers in those days. We, we had to get books and <laughs> read libraries and God knows what and look for the tradition of furniture. And so they would go back to each century, make drawings, and re- re- all the way right back. So, so we got to the stage where, well, what the hell did they sit on? They must have sat on a tree trunk or a stone. Now, all of this is recorded. So you don't start just with an idea, and that's what I'm going to do. No way. Because by the time going through all this, hundreds of other ideas will suddenly come to you. Seaweed and things like that. That's the other thing I used to do. I always used to make them collect from nature. I'd take them down the beach, and they'd all have to come back with a bag full of seaweed, shells, bones, anything they could pick up. Uh, and, it's, you know, I, I do the same. Uh, and that's how I used to do it. Uh, one student of mine who was particularly good, he did A-level, he, wa- he was a, um, a mathematician and a bio... Um, not chemistry. Not, not biochemist. Yeah, it's sort of that yeah. sort of stuff. That's what he was going to go in for. But he came to my design class and he loved it. And when it came to deciding what he would do for A-level, his father came up and said, oh, all that art stuff's a waste of bloody time. Uh, he's going to be a, you know, I said, fair enough, I said, but uh, it's not your decision to make, it's the boys. Mm-hmm. If he wants to do design, you let him do design, I said, because if you don't, and he doesn't get what he wants, he's going to come back to you and say, you know. Yes. He wanted to be an architect, mm-hmm. and for architect you had to know maths and physics, and, and you didn't have to have art. To be an architect, you don't have to have an art qualification. Yes. And that still stands today. Physics, mathematics, that's, those are the, anyway, he got to, into Bath. And a year later, I met him. No, a term later, I met him. How did you get on, Jonathan? Great, he said. Great. I said, what sort of things have you been doing then? I said, what was your first brief? He said, well, we had to design a bus shelter. I said, oh. I said, what, uh, what happened? He said, well, he said, like you, like you do with you. I said, he said, I went out into the, into the countryside. <laughs> and I found some mushrooms and fungi. And I took them back. And I started drawing them. And the lecturers came up to him and said, who the hell taught you to do that? <laughs> All the others had their pieces of paper and they were sketching ideas. He went back to nature. 
and he came up top student of the year. Mm. That's all I can say about going yeah. back to nature and starting from not the good idea. Not, right. not a preconceived idea. No, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It blinkers you. It shuts down all the other possibilities that can happen. It, uh, so, yeah, keep, that's the way I keep do. it. Up. <laughs> Great. Um, what I think we'll do is we'll go in the other room. Go on, yeah. Yep, I thought the Thank you.